I'm coming to you from the traditional terries of, territories of the Mishasaga, the Anishinaabe, the Odnashone, and the Huron Wendat. Um, I am uh, particular. I'm always mindful when I when I make that land acknowledgement, um, particularly uh, so I suppose these these days because I've been planning uh, with Russell Coy, who was our candidate in Victoria uh, in the last election. And I kind of joke with her that she was the most winning of the losing candidates in the last election because she came the closest to winning her seat. I think it was only a couple thousand, a uh, few thousand off. Um, uh, and so again, another person who, who had extraordinary results. Um, we are, um, Rosel is a very, uh, very strong uh, Indigenous leader and uh, she's someone that I've been working closely with throughout the campaign and we're going to be acknowledging Emancipation Day, which is August the 1st in the next couple of days. Emancipation Day um, was the day that slavery was abolished in the territories that became known, came to be known as Canada. And, um, you know, slavery wasn't just something that touched Black people and the black um, people of African descent, but indigenous peoples also were, were slaves um, and uh, were able to be held as slaves. And so this is some, a holiday that we, a holiday, it's a national day um, that we both recognize. And as she always says, it's, it's, it's a bittersweet thing because we recognize that legacy, but we also celebrate. We celebrate how far we've come and how much we've achieved and how much more we can do together. So um, that's, that's uh, the acknowledgement. And I know we have very little time, so I wanted to leave as much of it as possible to you and your questions. I'm sure you all, um, have, given that you're very loyal Greens and you're here with me this evening, you've been participating in the debates and watching the debates. You're probably feeling a little bit of Zoom fatigue with the leadership contest. Um, and I'm assuming that some of you know the basics about me. Um, but I will say just very briefly that uh, I was born and raised in Toronto. Um, I went to law school at the University of Ottawa, um, particularly for its Indigenous law program. I have a master's from Princeton University in public and international affairs. Uh, my professional work after my graduate studies in Canada focused on creating the first institute in Canada uh, that was that was a, a research advocacy and organizing um, organization for um, marginalized groups and underrepresented groups who are seeking to become elected um, and to enter political life. And so I'm very proud of the work that we did there and the number of um, people that we helped to make their first steps into politics from groups that were um, and still are um, traditionally underrepresented. And then my career took an international turn. I went with uh, my family to Europe and I worked uh, uh, during the years there primarily in public diplomacy and international relations. Um, first for our government and our mission to the European Union and then at uh, the International Criminal Court uh, followed by um, a stint in civil society working um, as um, directing the EU operations for an international conflict prevention NGO, and finally, by creating yet another new thing, um, a, an innovation hub that's based in Barcelona that um, works uh, to, as a catalyst for young international NGOs working on the most difficult global challenges, including the climate emergency. And so that, um, that um, uh, social enterprise is still there in, in Barcelona doing its good work. And so I'm running for the Green Party of, of Canada um, for the reasons some of you may know, but just to say that I have all the faith um, that this party is the, the right party for this time. Um, I believe that all that has happened uh, since the pandemic hit has only served to reinforce all the reasons that I joined the party. It's the one that is offering the, the solutions to the most difficult challenges of our time. Um, and that doesn't include just the climate emergency and the pandemic and our need for more social justice and our need uh, to dismantle systemic racism, but also our need to, um, to uh, repair uh, the deficit in our democratic structures, uh, the need to make sure that we have more voices at the table when decisions about their lives and their communities are being made. 
Um, these are things that are core values for the Green Party, and we've seen how important our core values have been in general during this pandemic. And so I want uh, to see us be as ready as we can be to take on the leadership role that we should be taking uh, come the next election on behalf of people in Canada. And we do that by making sure that we have diversified our party internally, and not just our candidates, but also our membership and um, our leadership on our council and also in our professional staff. Uh, we do it by making sure that we stay very loyal to our commitment to democratic renewal um, and always modeling cooperation and collaboration in, in, in everything that we do so that we can uh, be you know, very good um, um, champions of that uh, in terms of politics in general. And then the daring. When I talk about daring, I mean that we, we definitely know that given we have never faced these kind of challenges before, uh, it is very unlikely that things that we have done before and approaches we have done, we have used before are going to work. We're going to need innovative ideas. We're going to need novel solutions. And a party like ours uh, that is very committed to um, the innovative evidence-based policies that help, um, help us to move forward and work on behalf of people in Canada is exactly what is needed. And so we need to do what we do best, which is be the party uh, right at the cutting edge of politics on behalf of people in Canada. And so that's our shared vision in, in my campaign for the, the party. Um, I'm certainly hoping it's one that many of you share. Um, I will only just correct Mike um, to say, I think he's dropped off, but to say that I became the, um, um, critic for international affairs last year. And so it may feel like years <laughs> to me and everyone else, <laughs> but in fact, it was only, it was, it was just the one and I miss it terribly. I really, really enjoyed working uh, with the other critics. I really enjoyed um, the opportunity to rep represent green values um, in terms of our policies and statements um, in relation to foreign affairs. So. Um, it was a lot to give it up, but I, I, I think that this was certainly worth it. And I look forward to your questions, um, your comments, your observations about the race. Um, this is your time. Thank you so much for that great introduction. Um, so I think to start off, David W. has a question. David, do you want to? unmute yourself and ask. Hi, David. Hi. Uh, thank you, Stacy, and thank you very much, Anne-Marie, or Anne for uh, coming and joining us uh, this evening. Um, as most people on the call know uh, about me, I am a very uh, strong enthusiast for proportional representation. I believe that all voices getting together and working collaboratively for what is best for our country and for our citizens is the best way uh, of approaching politics. And uh, I had heard you speak um, about uh, your position that you would uh, like to see a referendum. Uh, I'm just wondering if you've reconsidered that at all, or if not, how you would, with that format of having a referendum, how you'd get to the end game of having us get to proportional representation as referendums typically are designed to fail. Um, but uh, that's a very, very important issue. And uh, I'd like to hear more about how you'd like to see us accomplish uh, getting to PR. Uh, so thank you. Sure, thank you. And uh, it's a very good question. Um, and you're right, yes, I put out, um, um, I, I, I'm very interested in deliberative uh, democracy, particularly after my years in, in Europe, uh, where they, I would say in some ways, are a bit you know, light years ahead of us on that. Uh, and so, yes, when we had, before we had the fair vote debate, I thought it would be a good time to put out what I thought would be a, an actionable plan to get us there in the shortest delay. And when I did that, I was thinking very much, I had very much in mind uh, the, the Irish example. Um, not only because I was in Europe during the years um, that, uh, that they were going through their own uh, deliberative uh, democratic process, uh, but also because my husband, who's an international human rights lawyer, does a lot of work uh, with the Irish government. And I'd always really admired how they had taken these very, very difficult, um, very divisive issues, things like equal marriage, 
um, things like abortion uh, that they hadn't been able to successfully deal with just within their national assembly uh, and build enough of a consensus around to get it passed finally. And in their case, um, you know, they had they had to have and they did have uh, referenda to um, to ratify those decisions, and 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 they were ratified and it was successful. Um, and so when I made the proposal, that was the example that I had most in mind. Uh, but you know, since then I've spoken to quite a lot of people, and I think it's really important uh, for anyone who wants to be an, an honest politician. Uh, to be able to say, you know, I, that's how I felt. And I've spoken to people who understand the, the, you know, the local conditions better or the circumstances better than I do. Um, and they've told me that they don't feel that we could replicate that success here. Um, and they expressed some of the concerns that you did about that. Um, in light of that, uh, I, I, I'm going to be revising my policy uh, to remove that part of it. Um, you know, I really want to make sure that when we do proportional representation that it becomes um, entrenched and embedded and it's not something that can easily be overturned by the next government, um, that there is some way of the public indicating a strong uh, commitment to it. Um, but it's clear that, uh, you know, we don't have necessarily the same set of conditions here that they have had in other countries where referenda have been a good part of these kind of processes. And so, you know, I'm definitely going to defer to, uh, to the experts, people more expert than me, and say that that's something that, um, that I should remove. So yes, with that, I think that we are, we are head, you know, we still have, I, well, we have an even quicker path to proportional representation under the plan that, um, that, I, uh, that I recommended, which really, I think the only element that some people still quite have questions about is whether there should be a citizens assembly or not. I still think that there should be, uh, because I, I do believe, again, there has to be some way beyond just a, a mandate through a vote um, in a general election that gives a, an extra bit of strength to it, particularly since there isn't consensus amongst the political parties that we should have proportional representation. And I wouldn't want to see it reversed from one government to the next because it was just a piece of legislation brought in by a, by a group with potentially a weak mandate. I hope that answers your question, but join me any Monday at 6 p.m. for Question Anatomy. That's my office hours. And we can have a nice long draw about uh, proportional representation and you can share all of your ideas and uh, you know, I'm, I, uh, I'm always ready to learn something new. I think you're on mute. Sorry. Oh. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Mel Roman, you have a question? Yes, hi, Anne-Marie, Anne um, thank you for joining us, first of all. Uh, you know, I've been giving a lot of thought about the, what kind of qualities uh, a new leader of the Green Party would need to have and what would be the biggest challenges that they would face, you know. I, I reflect on, on the uh, small representation we have in the, in the House of Commons right now. And, you know, the, the fact that so many Canadians, they, they, they don't uh, take the Green Party seriously enough to, you know, to actually support them as much as we think we should be supported. Um, in order to really exert greater influence and to advance the Green Agenda, I think we're going to need to grow the party to get more Canadians to buy into our agenda and to see us as a real practical alternative, not like a, the party of unicorns and, and uh, you know, ideologues, but, you know, I see this as a very practical alternative and to ultimately elect more Green MPs. So as a Green Party leader, what would you do to promote that growth? Yes, and thank you very much for that. And I agree with your, um, with uh, the, the analysis, you know, uh, people, uh, one of the elements um, that will allow us to win, make that breakthrough is really a conviction amongst the general public that we don't only have interesting ideas, but that we actually have the ability to see them through, to implement them. Um, and I think there still have been questions about our ability to govern, were we ever to be given that opportunity. I do think that uh, this, the, the pandemic uh, has, has, um, has given us new arguments that we can make about the practicality of our policies. 
many of the things that were in the last election were being criticized by the other parties and pundits as being overly ambitious, um, as, as being out of reach um, or being uh, unaffordable are things that we have either implemented uh, during the last number of months or that we are now talking about implementing. You know, we talked about the need to reform long-term care, to bring it under the Health Care Act. Uh, the Prime Minister has is now talking about doing that. We've talked about how important it was to clean up our orphan oil wells. We were told it was too expensive. The Prime Minister is now doing that. We were told that we were out on our own on guaranteed livable income in the last election. And now the NDP and 50 senators and Hugh Siegel and the Globe and Mail are all talking about how that has to be part of our uh, recovery. And so I believe that many of our ideas have been proven to be very practical. And when Canadians finally come up from air from the pandemic, they're going to realize that. Um, and certainly it's also our job to make sure uh, that, they, um, that they realize that. In terms of outreach, you know, we in our campaign, we try to practice what we preach from the very beginning and to model it every single day in our campaign. And so even with the pandemic, we have been completely determined to build alliances, build coalitions, um, connect with communities that have never connected with the Green Party before. Um, and I think that we've done that uh, quite successfully. We have an alliance now, uh, sorry, a coalition now of community organizations that are helping to support us along with uh, Paul Manley in having Emancipation Day uh, declared a national um, day. Um, we also have, we also built, um, we're building a coalition of artists and creatives who are working on climate action um, in terms of, again, supporting and collaborating together on the climate emergency. We've connected with ethnic communities that have never been in touch with the Green Party before and, um, and who are supporting us and volunteering with us. And so that, you know, that is how, it, how it's done. It's done from the grassroots. It's done by indicating that you're interested in, in true collaboration um, you know, with, with people on issues of common, um, common interest. Uh, and I also think it begins with selecting a leader that, uh, that is really committed to it and also knows how to do it because um, they have a track record of doing it. Great. Thank you. I believe that Teresa has a question. Uh, yes, uh, hold on here. Um, okay, um, so Toronto uh, traditionally has done, uh, is a weak spot for the Green Party. And would you be willing to move to a different area if uh, advisors recommend a specific riding or area to move to? Yes, I'm going to try to, I'm realizing we don't have an hour, we have to be brief for it. Yes, and I think that anyone who's serious about leading the party um, has to be willing to, uh, to do that. I think it's a collective decision about where the, uh, the leader of the party runs because it affects so many people, it affects the entire party, uh, so absolutely. My children are, are um, they're not grown, but they're out of the house. They may never be grown. <laughs> and my partner travels extensively for, for his, uh, his work. So wherever, wherever I am, we've been together for almost 30 years. Wherever I am is pretty much his home. So um, yeah. Uh, I also have a question. Mm -hmm. my, my question is um, something that I've thought about a uh, long time before the Black Lives Matter, um, you know, upsurge recently. Um, and that's about the lack of diversity within the Green Party, generally speaking. And so I wondered what ideas you had about addressing, addressing that. So very again, rap, rapid fire. Um, we, it's absolutely, and you know, the lack of diversity is holding us back nowhere more than in Ontario. Um, I don't believe that we're going to make a breakthrough until we tackle that just because of the demographics, never mind the issues of equity and our core values. Um, and so the way that you do it simply puts, and as I said, I spent, I spent five years after graduate school working on just this. Um, so the way, the way that you do this is you, you um, 
We're, you, you scout the talent. Um, it's very important for every person to always have their ears and eyes open for talent emanating from traditionally underrepresented communities. Um, when you scout the talent, then it's everyone's job to recruit it. Um, some of you know, and some of you might not know, but it takes a lot of asking, particularly these days, to get really um, competent, um, committed, passionate uh, people in the community to consider politics because it's not a lot of fun. And a lot of people either are turned off by it or they've never thought of it, particularly if you come from an underrepresented community. So you have to actively recruit it and ask people. Um, you know, do, ask people. People asked me, for instance, and it made all the difference in the world when people said to me, you should really think about this. You know, I see qualities in you that would make, um, that could make a good leader. Uh, so you recruit it and then you support it. Um, one of the things that we tend to do with people who uh, run from um, underrepresented groups is we tend, parties in general tend to put them in unwinnable graveyard ridings where there's just no hope whatsoever. Uh, people from underrepresented groups are as electable as anyone else. There's lots of research that confirms that. You just need to put them in winnable ridings. You need to help them to fundraise, help them to get, you know, bring in volunteers and all of the rest of it. Um, and then finally, vote for that. Vote for those people uh, when you have the opportunity to do so and encourage other people to. And if we do that and we demonstrate an intentional approach to it, the way that the other political parties have, then we actually, it, it becomes a self-reinforcing thing. Um, I'll say in the case of our campaign, for instance, the fact that I am a woman of color meant that I, without even saying anything, it was clear to other women of color and to other people of color, oh, this is a campaign where I probably would feel comfortable. Um, and so, you know, we, it's a very simple formula, but it has proven to be very, very effective. And frankly, it's something that we need to implement before the next election, because without it, um, I, I don't hold out a lot of hope that we're going to make a breakthrough in Ontario. And we should be the next natural base for uh, the Green Party of Canada. There needs to be another base outside of the coast. Ontario is the logical place for that. Um, this is one of the things that we have to address uh, in order to make that happen. Thank you. Yeah, I, don't, I saw a note in the chat that said that people are okay with staying a little longer. I'm, I'm fine if you are, if you wanna add another five or 10 minutes, if there are other questions. Um, you know, I, this is a good though, it's good for discipline. You just try to, <laughs> I missed the cards from the, uh, how many of you were at the debate last night? None of you? Oh my goodness. We had, um, I think at its height, we had something approaching 450 people on, on that call. This was the BC town hall. Um, and they were ruthless with the time cards. They had, we had 30 second lightning rounds and it, um, it was tough, but it worked, uh, it worked pretty well. Fun. Um, okay, uh, Mel does have another question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, you know, when I look over the, you know, the Green Party policies, there are so many things that we want to do, right? There, you know, there are some unifying themes, but, you know, there are so many different goals that we want to work towards. And I'm wondering, you know, if you were the Green Party leader, what would be the most high priority policy goals that you would like to see the Green Party focus on in the near term? And what strategies would you use to accomplish those goals? It's a great question. And of course, uh, as a, as a long-term green, um, green member, as I'm sure you are, you know that the answer is that will really be up to um, our membership, you know, to decide that. And certainly not up to me on my own. Um, I can tell you what I would like it to be. Uh, but then, you know, one of the tricky things, but one of the beautiful things about the Green Party is that you then have to build a consensus around your approach. Uh, I was very attracted to the Green Party when I was deciding which political party to join. I had never joined a political party before the Green Party, despite all of my years in and around politics. Um, I joined because uh, we really, uh, you know, we resist a hyper concentration of, of power uh, in the leader and in the entourage of the leader that um, even though it's not perfect, we're really striving towards a more member-driven, grassroots type of policy development um, and also policy prioritization, I would say. Um, that being said, I definitely have my ideas. And certainly uh, given this, 
this, this tragic moment that we are living through that we didn't expect six months ago, um, but is here and upon us, uh, which is the pandemic, given the historic amounts of money that we've spent and that we are definitely going to be spending in order to stimulate our economy once we're able to even talk about a recovery, um, I don't think that we're going to have another opportunity in the, um, in the foreseeable future to do more to get us on the road towards um, our green transition. Um, I want to make sure that the money uh, that is being used and what we're talking about most as a party is how to make every single dollar that is going to be spent count uh, to accelerating our transition uh, towards a, you know, a sustainable green economy. And so I'm looking for us to be talking about spending money on things like um, national public infrastructure projects, uh, retrofitting buildings, investing in, um, in renewables, um, you know, creating things like a guaranteed livable income, which are going to allow us um, to help people make the transition as quickly as possible um, away from um, extractive uh, industries. Uh, that's really what I, I want to see. And also, I want to make sure, of course, that we're um, closing these gaping holes in our, our social safety net. But the green recovery is really uh, where we have to be spending our money and our time because the climate emergency is hasn't taken a pause. Um, and, uh, you know, we might not never have a pot of money like this again to do so much with. Thank you. As, as I maybe like a thumbs up that I'm getting, it's really great positive reinforcements. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as, as maybe a final, uh, final question, which is sort of an extension of that. Why, why you, how, how are you, how are you different? What do you, what do you bring for us that uh, yes. can really inspire us? Well, it's an excellent question. And um, I, I hope part of the answer is the fact that it's, it's always a little challenging for me to answer because Greens, you know, we're humble. We, we're people that we don't mind sharing the limelight. Uh, we try not to be too, uh, too pushy. Sometimes to a fault, I would say, you know, we, you need to be able to um, highlight your, your pluses. Um, and so in my case, I'm going to you know, do my best to, to do that. Um, I think the reasons that I ran, I would say, are the reasons that I think that I make a very good fit at this moment for the party. Uh, I ran because first and foremost, uh, I want to contribute my personal experience and my lived experience, um, all of the things that I've been collecting all, throughout all of these years through my education and my work, um, and just everything else that I've done, I want to contribute all of that to the Green Party at this time. Um, I believe that uh, it's very clear that if we're going to solve these global challenges, we're going to have to cooperate with global partners. And so having someone like me who has really deep and extensive experience working in a global context uh, is definitely a plus for, for the party at a time when we're really you know, going to have to uh, you know, really understand how we can cooperate with the international community on solving these big challenges. Uh, also, coming back again to diversity, uh, again, not to be self-serving, but I believe before I joined the party and I've heard often during this campaign that this is something that is causing people to hesitate about the party. Um, people need to see themselves reflected in the party. And so having someone who has had the professional experience of, of diversifying institutions and attracting talent um, to institutions um, could only be a plus. And then the experience of, of being, uh, being an innovator, someone who has created things from scratch, someone who's been trained through their education to identify and implement innovative policy solutions. That's also something that is going to be, I think, a really premium skill for the party and also for the country at a time when we have so many novel challenges that we're facing. Um, and so, yes, and I also think I'd be a great conversation starter for the Green Party. Let's just also say that, you know, I, it's, uh, it's something, it's, an, it's a decision that I would say sends a very powerful signal of intention as well. Um, and so those are some of the things that I believe match me well to the party at this time. I would never say 
that um, you know, I, I ha don't have a manifest destiny about this. Where it can only be me, and there's no one like me in the entire universe. Uh, but I do believe that I'm I'm very well suited uh, to lead the party at this time if if the membership agrees with me. Well, thank you, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today and being so open to answer the questions. Um, I will be, we've recorded this and so uh, assuming everything goes well, we'll post it on our YouTube channel. That's the Waterloo Region Greens YouTube channel. And uh, I've also posted in the chat, uh, or Matt's posted in the chat, the list of upcoming um, leadership chats that we're going to be hosting, including next week, which is Glenn Murray. Uh, and so uh, with that, and I'll say thank you, and I hope that everybody continues to enjoy this lovely evening. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. À la prochaine. J'ai oublié de dire quelques mots en français, mais rassurez-vous que je suis tout à fait bilingue, tout à fait capable de parler dans les deux langues officielles, et c'est clair que c'est très important. Um, merci pour l'opportunité, et j'espère uh, de revoir tout le monde uh, demain soir uh, pour notre Bon, c'est vraiment une table ronde, pas un débat, mais notre réunion avec tous les candidats. See you tomorrow, I hope. <laughs> yes. Great Thank everyone. you so much. I love Have it. Good evening. Okay. Have a good night. Bye. 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 Bye.